There is a sanctuary in our Colorado for those willing to prepare for anything. And tonight, Denver 7's Thomas Hoppo takes you inside a place where you can go in the case of a disaster. In a world that's constantly changing. It's kind of one of those things that if you're stuck on a deserted island, who do you want to be with? All of us can be unaware of the risks our world faces. When that happens, that's going to lead to a collapse. Collapse means loss of law and order. And if that risk showed up in front of you, are you prepared? I am Kiki and I am prepared. Kiki is what you would call a prepper. First, we have to tell you what a prepper is. It's basically a survivalist for any type of disaster. I think it's more of a state of mind. When you think prepper, you think of someone preparing for some type of post-apocalyptic world, or zombies. Really? No, more like preparing for something like a nuclear fallout. Maybe not that extreme, or something like a natural disaster, like a volcano. Bottom line is, these survivalists are prepared for anything. It's very practical things. It's um, what happens if our grid goes down. People don't really stop and, and, and understand what the, the impact of that is to all of us. But where do you go in Colorado if something like that were to happen? Well, now there's a place. And the reason there's so many of us that prep is we understand human nature. This is Drew. This is his sanctuary in the heart of the Rockies, but I can't tell you where it is. Fortitude Ranch is both a survival facility and a recreational facility, and we are a fort. We are a defensive facility design. You know, we'll have walls up, some now a lot more in a collapse period. Fortitude Ranch, a place Drew is building for fellow preppers in Colorado. So that is the corner back there. Any prepper can be part of Fortitude Ranch. It's a little trap door here because we want a place downstairs for other guards to be in warmth. It's plan A for those like Drew. You have to be able to defend yourself, not just have food and water to last for a year, and a pandemic lasts over a year. With walls, shelters, and of course, just a typical 12-gauge pump. Protection from potential threats. If bad folks are coming to come get us, they'd be coming from out there. And all we have to do is just drop down and, you know, we've got a very small target. They're still in the process of building up their sanctuary. Well, we build out of logs for a lot of reasons. Eight-inch log stops a bullet a lot better than a typical frame wall. That's open to anyone willing to become a member. And Kiki is one of them. I really don't live for the zombie apocalypse. Uh, but it is nice to know that if something should happen, then there is a place to go. In the end, most preppers are just misunderstood. Well, I've been a prepper pretty much all my adult life. I was an intelligence officer in the Air Force, I've always watched threats. Perhaps I'm a fatalist, perhaps I'm just really responsible and prepared, I don't know. But I think it's better to be safe than sorry. And our Colorado is full of them. But again, they're not going to tell you they are. Preppers believe it's foolish not to have some preparations for a disaster. Reporting in... Well, somewhere in Colorado. The pandemics, social unrest, rumors of wars, and other disasters that people are worried about were prophesied over 2,000 years ago to happen. We are watching the fulfillment of these prophecies begin to take place right before our very eyes. It is a pretty good indicator that Jesus is returning soon when we see society preparing for the apocalypse. The truth is, these doomsday camps will not protect the unsaved from the wrath of God that is soon to come on an unbelieving, an unrepentant world. Only putting your faith in Jesus Christ can, and he is the only way. John 14 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Revelation 6 15 through 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Putting your trust in a bunker cannot save you from the wrath of God. Only putting your trust in Jesus Christ can save you, and he is the only way. I want to pose a question to you guys. Should Christians be serious preppers? The world tells us there is wisdom in laying up provisions for bad times to come, and there are also examples in scripture of this. 
as in God warning Joseph in Pharaoh's dream to store grain before the famine in Egypt, and God advising Noah to build the ark and load provisions into it for the duration of the flood. What else does the Bible say about this? In Matthew 6, 19-21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In verses 25 and 31 through 34, Jesus continues, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Those passages make it clear that the Lord wants us to put our faith in him alone. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Psalm 39, 7. Is prepping in keeping with God's instructions for us? Not if you look to Jesus' words in Matthew 6. But if we do choose to prepare, how much is enough? Three to six months stockpile of food, water, and other supplies? How could we ever know how much we would need? The answer is that we can't know. And I believe therein lies the key to the whole issue. If you do prep for the last days, will you share your provisions with others? Jesus said this in Matthew 25, 35 through 40. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. James 2.15-17 If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Again, should Christians be serious preppers? God makes it clear that he wants to be the sole object of our faith and trust. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6.33 All we have comes from God. Unhealthy prepping is when it becomes more important to us than trusting the Lord to know what's coming and what we will need. The Lord knows what's coming, and he knows what we will need. He will give Christians the things we need when we need them. While prepping can be a great help in certain situations, it is not what saves us or takes care of us. Only the Lord does that, and while we may choose to be preppers, as Christians, we must always keep our focus on Him. When prepping, we are putting our trust in ourselves and not in God. Hebrews 12.2 Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? He is returning. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Matthew 24, 12 And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. In this prophecy, 
Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. A family mowed down in front of a convenience store. And investigators say the driver's actions in this deadly crash were deliberate. Good evening. I'm Maurice Dubois. And I'm Christine Johnson. Right now on CBS2 and streaming on CBSN New York, a Rockland County mother is dead and her husband and six children hospitalized. Investigators say it all started over a disagreement that turned deadly. CBS2's Ali Bauman live in Haverstraw where the suspect is in court tonight. Ali. Jason Mendez is charged with one count of murder and seven counts of attempted murder. Police say he deliberately drove into a family of eight, the youngest victim not even one year old. 35-year-old Jason Mendez, wide-eyed and silent as he's walked into court wearing handcuffs. Mendez is accused of driving his car into two parents and their six children Wednesday after getting in an argument with the family outside the 7-Eleven on North Central Highway around 2 p.m. The suspect then got into his vehicle and uh, deliberately, it appears deliberately, uh, took the vehicle and rammed it into these individuals. And then we believe, uh, backed up the vehicle, and it subsequently hit the, subs uh, the victims again. The police captain says officers raced to the scene and had to take the suspect down at gunpoint. He had a knife in his hand. The officers asked him to put the knife down and refused to do so. And the officer tased him and took him down to the ground, and then we took him into custody. All eight victims were taken to nearby hospitals. The 32-year-old mother was pronounced dead. Her 35-year-old husband and their six children, all younger than the age of 10, are being treated for their injuries. This is a tragedy. It doesn't happen very frequently, if at all, in our community, but it's a tragedy that happened today. The father and six children are expected to survive. Police say that argument which set the suspect off may have stemmed from the father asking the suspect not to blow cigarette smoke near his children. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 through but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. We are going to move now to the arrest of a U.S. Coast Guard lieutenant. Prosecutors are calling him a domestic terrorist, a self-described white nationalist with a collection of weapons and a list of people he wanted to kill, including U.S. senators and media personalities. David Martin reports. The motion to keep Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Hassan in jail until he can be brought to trial warns that he intends to murder innocent civilians on a scale rarely seen in this country. It quotes a draft email in which he says, I am dreaming of a way to kill almost every last person on the earth. Start with biological attacks, followed by attacks on food supply. Institute a bombing sniper campaign. When federal agents searched his basement apartment in the suburbs of Washington, they found 15 firearms and over 1,000 rounds of ammunition. They also found a hit list, which reads like a who's who of liberal politics. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer, and presidential contenders Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and Cory Booker. The list also includes television anchors from MSNBC and CNN. According to court documents, Hassan, who once served in the Marines, described himself as a longtime white nationalist who supports the idea of a white homeland. He read the writings of a Norwegian domestic terrorist named Anders Breivik, who eight years ago went on a rampage which killed 77 Norwegians, many of them teenage summer campers. Officials say they believe Hassan was not just fantasizing, but was serious about carrying out his plans for mass murder. He is scheduled to appear in court tomorrow. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return, as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. We start with this breaking news from Chicago where Empire actor Jesse Smollett is in police custody after turning himself in overnight. He is accused of faking a hate crime after his story of being attacked by racists fell, piece, fell to pieces. Smollett has been charged with disorderly conduct for filing a false police report, which is a felony in the state of Illinois. Dean Reynolds has covered this investigation since it began last month. Police in Chicago say Smollett lied to them last month when he claimed two masked Trump supporters shouting racist and homophobic slurs beat him up in the middle of the night near his apartment building. Smollett last spoke on national TV before suspicion turned to him. I still want to believe with everything that has happened that there's something called justice. Two of Smollett's acquaintances, Ola and Abel Asandairo, told investigators the actor directed and paid them to stage that attack. Gloria Schmidt is their attorney. There was a point where this story needed to be told, and they manned up and they said, you know what, we're going to correct this. The men are cooperating with police and have not been charged. Schmidt says they testified before a grand jury for about two and a half hours Wednesday. This surveillance video obtained by CBS Chicago station WBBM shows the Osendairo brothers buying a red cap, gloves, and a ski mask the day before Smollett claims he was assaulted. I think he should unload that conscience and just come out and tell the American people what actually happened. Smollett's lawyers, who have been joined by famed criminal defense attorney Mark Garagos, vowed an aggressive defense. In a statement, they said, like any other citizen, Mr. Smollett enjoys the presumption of innocence, particularly when there has been an investigation like this one where information, both true and false, has been repeatedly leaked. Now, if convicted, Jesse Smollett could face a fine of $25,000 and up to three years in prison. When we read the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 24 through 32, there are three phases of judgment God uses on a society that no longer believes in him or his ways. The first phase of judgment is an impure heart, as we read in verse 24. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts. The second phase of judgment is sexual lust, resulting in homosexuality as we read in verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving themselves the penalty of their error which was due. The third phase of judgment is a debased mind, resulting in all kinds of evil, as we read in verses 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, 
not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. There can be no doubt we are living in the end times right before Jesus Christ returns as we link 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 with Romans 1, 28 through 32. In 1979, the world was introduced to the menacing glare of the Ayatollah Khomeini. His Iranian revolution ousted the Shah of Iran, a U.S. ally, and put its mark on American history with a hostage crisis that lasted more than a year. Its leaders began to purge the country of Western influence and set Iran on a path of expansion and Islamist terror. During the revolution, the U.S. was dubbed the Great Satan by the ruling mullahs. Still, most of their hatred was reserved for the country they called the Little Satan, Israel. For four decades, they have vowed to wipe it off the map. The show of force continued this month as Iran paraded its missiles in Tehran. I think a clash is inevitable. Middle East expert Michael Widlansky says according to Israeli military sources, Iran has armed Hezbollah in Lebanon with enough missiles to bombard all of Israel for weeks. Lebanon itself is so well armed with Hezbollah missiles and rockets that Israel could face every day not 10 rockets, not 100 rockets, but 2,500 rocket attacks every day over a period of three weeks. And that doesn't take into account Iran's nuclear program. In last year's UN address, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu exposed a secret nuclear site with 300 tons of nuclear material. Now, I also have a message today for the tyrants of Tehran. Israel knows what you're doing, and Israel knows where you're doing it. Israel will never let a regime that calls for our destruction to develop nuclear weapons. Not now, not in 10 years, not ever. While with Lansky warns Israel can take care of itself, he worries if the mullahs aren't stopped, their grand design could swallow up the region. The Iranians want Shia Islam to be the face of Islam. That means they want to go after Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait. They want to go after all their neighbors and project their force all the way to the Mediterranean and to the Atlantic. They want to go through Lebanon and then through North Africa. They want to go through Yemen. They have a real, real expansionist process, which is similar to what the communists and the Nazis had. This is not just a religious calling. This is very serious power politics strategy playing. Iraqi forces fire mortars at ISIL targets across the Syrian border. The village of Baghouz, the last ISIL controlled territory in Syria, isn't far from here. The mainly Kurdish US backed Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, estimate there are around 300 ISIL fighters still inside. The Iraqi military and pro-Iran armed groups are determined to stop them escaping across into Iraq. They've set up cameras around 10 kilometers inside Syrian territory to monitor ISIL fighters as the SDF offensive goes on. While the Iraqi military operation against ISIL across the border in Syria continue, we on this side are fortifying our positions. We have installed thermal surveillance cameras across the border inside Syria territory. There is joint cooperation with us, the pro-Iran armed groups and the tribal sheikhs. We are getting aerial support from the U.S.-led coalition. U.S. intelligence says ISIL evolved from the last remnants of al-Qaeda in Iraq and by 2015 it controlled around 90,000 kilometers of territory across Syria and Iraq. An international coalition of more than 70 countries has been involved in the fight to reclaim that territory. This is all that remains of the Anuri Mosque where more than four and a half years ago Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared himself caliph of what he described as the ISIL caliphate. Now as fighting continues on the Syrian side of the border against the last pockets of ISIL fighters there, there are fears of ISIL sleeper cells among Iraqis living close by. These are Iraqi military checkpoints around the town of Heat in western Anbar province. 
ISIL was defeated here in 2015, but sleeper cells have kidnapped and murdered a number of people in recent weeks. Saeed Omar and his wife Sanaa sit with their grandchildren at their home. They both suffered under the brutality of ISIL's rule and are terrified by the thought the group could ever one day return. The more SDF in Syria have pushed ISIL toward the Iraq border, the more difficult it has become for Iraqis to work in the countryside nearby. There are ISIL cells in the desert around here. It's terrible that they kidnap innocent people. The government and the army need to thoroughly search this area because ISIL are still hiding here. The people here have suffered so much under ISIL already. The head of Iraq's intelligence says ISIL fighters are regrouping and recruiting mainly in the rural areas of north and western Iraq they once controlled. U.S. military intelligence believes the territorial battle against ISIL across Syria and Iraq has been won. But the fight against small groups of fighters and sympathizers across this vast region will go on. The measles outbreak in the Philippines, which began early this month, appears to be far from over. More than 130 have died as of February 13th, according to the health department. And the number of those who've had measles has reached 8,000. Now, Health Secretary Francisco Duque says he sees no end to the outbreak until about 95% of 2 million targeted individuals are vaccinated. That was the percentage covered by measles vaccines before there was a vaccination scare in the Philippines. Due to fears, the dengue vaccine Dimbaksha was causing deaths. Now, in 2017, Dimbaksha's manufacturer came out with a warning saying those who've never had dengue could be hospitalized if they get dengue fever after they've been vaccinated with Dimbaksha. So that, plus the fact that the issue was politicized, caused widespread fears and an anti-vax movement. So prior to that, measles was on its way to getting eradicated in the Philippines. But now, health workers are having to explain, sometimes for 30 minutes to an hour, they say to each parent how the Mbaksha is a totally separate issue and that the measles vaccine, along with other vaccines, have been proven safe and effective. That there is no other solution to the outbreak but vaccination. And so health workers are now going house to house. The health, uh, the health department, rather, is putting up makeshift vaccination centers. They're doing it even at fast food restaurants because this is a race against time. Measles is a highly communicable disease and everyone, especially children, are vulnerable. People around the world are asking what is going on. Everything seems to be falling apart in every possible way. Violence is at epidemic levels with all the nations around the world full of anxiety and uncertainty of what tomorrow will bring. The Middle East is consumed by civil wars. Planet Earth is on the verge of World War III. Earthquakes are more frequent and more intense. Extreme weather has become the norm. We are seeing diseases that were once eradicated roaring back to life. People are starving to death because of politics, war, drought, and other weather-related catastrophes. People are looking for answers, and those who have eyes to see and ears to hear know exactly what is happening. Jesus, who is God in flesh form, is letting us know that through the events taking place around the world, he is returning. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. Occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.